We've been, been here a little while and yeah. absorbing all of this. Yeah. And from what I remember, when we first talked in California, you just there was a call into spiritual community after I guess the last three years of this real dedicated practice. I guess some people would think it, it was. Uh, you, you can share about it. It's a very dedicated practice, and then. Maybe just share how it's been coming here and mm -hmm. some of your experience in the first several weeks of, of being here. Yeah, I mean it was, yeah that dedicated practice seemed to correlate with our discovering the Course in Miracles. Found it on the internet, I downloaded and we blitzed through and read it uh, right up until Christmas Day we finished. And it kind of launched us uh, very soon after that. Uh, we left our residence and lived in our car basically for a year <clears throat> in very, very, you know, deep study of the Course. I mean, we continued to read and do the lessons and it took us in many different locations seeming, but every day it was, it was that, uh, the, the pressing to dive deeper and deeper into the message of the Course in Miracles. That's beautiful. Though. When you think of it, leaving residence, living out of your car, and this reminds me of my early travels in 1991, because I, I met uh, these two people that were in Sedona, living out of their car. They had a little Nimrod pop-up camper behind them, and they had left their jobs of uh, like a choreographer and and singer and, and had just immersed into, at that point, The Course in Miracles and the Arantia book. They had both side by side and they were, that was their whole life of living on the creek bed of a beautiful Sedona creek bed and just giving themselves over. So just that is very inspirational, I think, for a lot of people because they, they think in their mind, I wish I could devote a little more time to the Course because it's drawing me, but that's a beautiful witness that you actually just followed your heart and left your residence and kind of became like vagabonds for God or gypsies for God uh, to really give yourself an immersion. So was that was about a year of just immersing? It was a year, yeah. And then what came after that? Well, when we left for that year, we the feeling was you have to pull up the anchor. You know, we're asking mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit to be the wind in our sails, but we had to pull up the anchor. Yeah. Oh yeah, so that was, we all know that. <laughs> we won't know where the anchor is <laughs> is down. Then we landed in a home. We thought for three months, and it was two years. And this was like a work exchange situation where That's you still how, could dedicate a lot of your time to oh, this. Oh yeah, it was. It started out as <clears throat> it was a work exchange, uh, but it was more of a holy encounter. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah. A long, a long-term two-year holy encounter. Uh, a lot of beautiful encounters, encounters yeah. with, mm -hmm. with many people yeah. in that place, um, in the in the guise of work exchange. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, this was kind of somewhere in between, like Sacramento and and Oakland. It was more of the middle area there where I met you. Right, right. Right. Of course, actually, we met at one of my talks. Didn't right. we? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. when I was in the Bay Area. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that Boston. actually. The beginning of the three years, I had seen a picture of you on the website, and I remember I said to Lonnie, "I'm like, this is the real deal." And I actually said, "We're going to hook up with these folks," yeah. but I didn't even look in the website. Like it wasn't time. Mm -hmm. It seemed like I needed those years yeah. to meet up. You just felt it; it would come. It was so clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there was no pursuit. And then, and then someone called when you were in town and said. I think you might be interested in this. Yeah, and that was a little bit north of San Francisco, was it when you came to that yeah. gathering, that talk? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then it seems like a lot of unwinding when we settled in, you know, having a roof over our heads and minimal projects, um, so it wasn't really distracting, it was just mm -hmm. a good function. Mm -hmm. But there was for me, there were waves of restlessness, you know, because it was still undoing the world, like still undoing the menu. Like I'd look for jobs occasionally, and Lonnie would say to me, "I'd look on Craigslist," and he's like, "You know, do you do you really just want to choose from the menu of the world?" Like, mm. so I grappled with that, mm. and the inner guidance just, you know, as you know, kept being to get even quieter. Mm. 
That's beautiful, though, in the face of... That's a common thing that most people can relate to. There's this, this past conditioning yeah. that's like, get a job, get a job, get a job. And, mm -hmm. and even, like, for some people that are, like, young, like I just read this morning, there was a, a kid that camped out in AOL. He, he graduated from high school, he went out, and he lived for two months in the AOL studios without anybody knowing. He would move around from couch to couch to couch, mm -hmm. and he would have Coke and cereal and water for breakfast and work late, and they saw him. He was part of a project that he had a badge, but then he, he basically, his badge kept working, so he decided he lived there. And he spent $30 a month. He, he mm -hmm. splurged for Thanksgiving, go to Boston Market or occasional McDonald's, but $30 a month he was living. But in your case now, here you are, you've, you've got a, it was a PhD in psychology, so you're highly qualified. And what the world would say, you know, you've lived in, in Israel and you've moved around the world, and so you kind of went through a period of achievement and accomplishment, and now the voice is saying, get a job, get a job, and people would say, and you even have the qualifications, and the spirit's like, quiet, let it go, come inside. So that can even seem like a stronger conflict when you seem to have the skills and abilities that the work were, workforce would say are very helpful. So that was probably a, a beautiful one. And then your partner giving you the encouragement, yeah. you know, really from the Holy Spirit, would you really choose from the menu of the world? Mm -hmm. You know, that's beautiful because that's just giving you a beautiful reflection that you're worthy of yeah. going much, much deeper. Yeah, there was the unwinding too of like wanting to be used. You know, we do counseling mm -hmm. and I started to really see, just always coming back to that worthiness, you know, just mm -hmm. Just a lot of unwinding of the, now I have language with you guys, yeah. the self-concept, yeah. the constructs. Yeah. Distractions weren't so much an issue for me, but the, the disorientation of, of, uh, of stepping back from the world, yeah. yeah. So that's a good topic, that even the helping professions, even service, which I think all of us know that the service is a big aspect of the spiritual journey, there's no denying that. But we also know that the ego can hijack the concept of service, and that's why a lot of people that are in the helping professions have a lot of burnout. There's actually a pretty high suicide rate in the helping professions on the one hand, and then there's a pretty strong burnout rate in social services kind of areas, which I've worked in a number of myself, and I've seen people pour their hearts out, but, but there were some ego motives in there of being the helper and saving lives and saving people that eventually, you know, you start to see that you will just completely wear out if you follow that track and then you have to go, oh, I'm here to be truly helpful. It takes you a notch higher and higher into that, including the stillness, which right. from the world's perspective, that just doesn't seem like a real practical good use of time when you could be out helping people <laughs> instead. And, and even in helping in any form, like I just, I love every kind of work and so I kept, there was a big thing, there was an elderly woman living upstairs from us and she had a lot of fantasies of me meeting physical needs of hers and that was another unwinding for me where that was another mighty companion help, just kept saying it's not about the form, it's not about the form, so that was a yeah. tremendous unwinding, she was a focus for that. Of, being in holy relationship with her and not being distracted. I recently transcribed, mm. yeah, one of your things on saying no. Mm. That when the mm -hmm. ego needs, you said no, but the holy encounter, yes. Yeah. You mm -hmm. can wake me at night yeah. or... And the barometer is kind of your happiness meter. Right. If you feel the joy and happiness and the tickle in your heart, then you're in true empathy. And yes. if not, then you can be in a, a, a false empathy kind of situation with perceived needs and perceived people problems and really going down the toilet, so to speak, emotionally because you lose your energy, you lose your spark in that right. way. It's very important. Yeah, mm -hmm. and the confusion of well, finding a place and just that horizontal, vertical, yeah, so so it just kept, spirit just kept saying even quieter and mm -hmm. even quieter. And then if we fast forward, you, so you packed up, you, you actually had some good emotional encounters with a friend who was storing a lot of your stuff mm -hmm. and had to go into true empathy with that, pack mm -hmm. things up, come across. Now you're out in a, a canyon in rural Utah and 
what has the experience been like at the, the Living Miracles Monastery? Um, it's been... When it's the next step, it just feels so comfortable and not joyful in an extent, you know, one of these ego ways, but it just feels so purposeful in my in my mind mm -hmm. to be there. It just it just feels really a, like an authentic next step to expand our community from two to many, and uh, having all a shared purpose. That's is incredible. just an amazing experience. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's beautiful. Shared purpose is yeah. just. The magnification of that. I, I just wrote an email to, to a family member. They asked, and I said, my experience here is maximal on every level, on every level. You know, like the only thing to speak with them is maybe they could relate to how beautiful it is, which I really, really don't care about. Yeah. I mean, but even on that level, mm -hmm. the experience is maximal. Yeah. It's beautiful because there's that steady inside that is drawing you in terms of purpose and you know it's you're just in the right place and you feel like you're everything is you're you're right where you're meant to be and that is a glorious feeling and then we do have these miraculous moments that are these little freeze frame moments like um, that was one of my most joyful moments we ended up taking a, a little trip over to uh, Colorado and um, we had lunch together which was nice and then Julie, who was kind of stewarding the food and everything, I was saying, what's for dinner? And she was saying, uh, chicken. We're having chicken tonight. <laughs> and uh, so I came down and, and they were good. And then the, the ecstasy moment was, I was kind of on the edge of the little picnic table, and, and Tara was over on the other edge of the picnic table. And there was Lonnie with like a little uh, spatula. <laughs> and and the flames from the chicken rose like four to five feet in the air. It was a roaring bonfire. And I just looked at Tara's face and she had the biggest smile on her face and her shoulders were going like this. And I looked over and there was Lonnie with the spatula and the biggest grin on his face from <laughs> ear to ear. And then the, the punchline came out, out of Tara's mouth. She says, you put a vegetarian on grill duty with chicken <laughs> and he's just like smiling from ear to ear it was one of those miracle moments where nothing I see means anything and we were all just laughing so hard and and then Greg came over with a little water bottle and tried to, <laughs> tried to put the forest fire out and he's throwing water on it and the flames were like you know <laughs> but that, that's the beauty of it I mean it's like they're living in spiritual community and you're really not going for form outcomes and goals, you're really going for the joy factor, for seeing the innocence, seeing the perfection of everything. And, you know, what turns, what the world would judge as a disaster turns into a happy, gleeful, miracle moment of, isn't this great that we see the, the film, the dream for what it is, and we end up laughing together, you know, and that. And the chicken was tasty too. And the chicken, I mean. it, it still came out, right? <laughs> now today, here we are at the picnic. Uh, Lisa went to great lengths to to boil the, the chicken today, before she passed it off to Jason. Uh, she says, "I've done this before, and this is the way you got to do it. I'm going to cook the chicken, get it out, give it over to Jason, throw some barbecue sauce on it, and get it over to the people to eat." But and, and it worked out well, but I, I mean, we had so much fun, and that, to me, is really what the whole thing of spiritual community is about. When, you're, when you get into this community, too, with, with interpersonal relationships and repulsions, like Nikita talked about, repulsions, and jealousies, and envies, and comparisons, and all of the things that the ego is known for, uh, they just come up so rapidly, just like those flames roaring off that chicken fat, uh, that's kind of what happens in spiritual community. It's like a, it's a fast burn, it's a fast way to, towards self-realization and enlightenment, mm -hmm. if you're willing to like hang in with it. And then when you do hang in, you feel the benefits. You feel like, well, I'm saving myself thousands of years, and the whole universe 
thousands of years by my willingness to just hang in there with this whole thing. So Absolutely. it's just, yes. I feel really grateful that you're, hey, that you're here. I'm so grateful. I, uh, also with that, just the one-mindness, you know that, like when, when you're sharing that stuff, Nikita, I mean, it's, it, you can really feel it that it's healing my mind, that it's just one. Yeah. That's yeah. been really yeah. palpable. That and the piece of function has just been a very strong impression for me. Well, after being told just to get quiet, so it's very joyful to have function, have assignments. Mm -hmm. But I, and language that I'm getting here for like the given, like whatever's given, whatever assignments, I'm really enjoying just leaning back and staying with that and observing when my mind thinks it has its own ideas. Yeah. Yeah, we just had, Lisa just had a show, uh, and uh, Jason and Francis and Jenny and I and Lisa were there, and we were talking about community and some of the main lessons and everything, and and it's so beautiful because it seems like those who are drawn to this community, it's intuitively, psychically, or whatever, they're just they're coming because they intuitively know that that the way out of the ego is through giving and extending, and then there's there's opportunities, roles, lessons, assignments. They may even be very quick, like we were just talking about. The crisis was saying you can outgrow them so quick, it's just a burst of joy and then it's gone. Okay, well what's next? You know, it right. it comes in and, and it's just this giving. And it's so different than the getting motive that's mm -hmm. so much part of mm -hmm. of society and try to attain things and accumulate things and and grow things and this is more just a state of mind goal that everybody agrees upon and therefore it's like there's an acceptance for whatever's coming up and you can feel that it's always your own lesson, that, that it's not mm -hmm. my lesson and your lesson, or their lessons, or they've got to go through their lessons, that all starts to just right. completely vanish. Totally. Yeah. How beautiful. Mm -hmm. And who would have thunk that, it, you know, during these three years of unwinding from the menu, you know, this is so far beyond anything. I, even if I just said, let me write the happiest dream possible, I couldn't have conjured it up. If, yeah, I still, I knew what I was saying no to, the reciprocity, but I ha didn't have a picture. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. Oh, thank you. It's like living in community, and I have a feeling, I, once the mind clears of the darkness, then the fruits of the Spirit just pour through us all. Yeah. So right before these interviews, we were in enjoying the music collaborations, mm -hmm. there's happy road trips, there's like the one to Colorado, which was flush, was a good flusher for many people, but there was a lot of joy there. And we don't even know how it all be used with, like this studio was a garage less than a year ago, just a plain garage with a bunch of old boxes in it, and now this is here and it's just another mechanism. We don't even care or count how many people are, are watching when we do live streaming, because we're having so much fun, there's so much joy in the fruits that it, we know it's all for us, and it doesn't matter really if anybody is actually tuning into the show. And that's good too, and I always have been joking lately saying, we don't have like a typical show, and now a word from our sponsors. We are the Word of God. <laughs> we are the Word from the sponsors. All of our happiness and joy, and even our authentic uh, willingness to heal, that's all sponsored by the Holy Spirit and by that intuition within. So, what a great life. What a great life. What a great life.